Roger Quigley, and I'm a member of the White Rock, White Rock, White Rock Hills Library Friends Organization. And it's my pleasure to introduce our president, Mr. Nick Harper, who would like to welcome you as, as, well, as well as I would here today. Thank you, Martha. Uh, on behalf of White Rock Hills uh, Branch Library and the uh, Public Library System, I'd like to welcome all of you here this afternoon. I'll uh, tell you a little short story in here. This time last year, we were getting ready to have our February uh, White Rock Hills Library Friends Board meeting, and a very sad, long face, Reverend Goodman, came down to trudge me into the meeting in here and sat down and looked like she'd lost her last friend. And I said, Donna, what in the world happened? Tell me who died. And she says, Oh, Mr. Harper, I tried to do a black history oration contest and nothing worked in here. I'm afraid I'm never going to be able to make this happen around Dallas. So congratulations and thank you to all of you who showed up today. You have fulfilled her dreams. Okay, ladies, do any of you have some aspirin? Anybody at all in your purse? Anybody have an aspirin? Yes, Martha? Would you take two aspirin to your every good room? She needs it right now. Betty Leo, would you like to come forward? Betty Leo, would you like to come forward and say a few words of greeting from the downtown, Dallas Public Library? Betty? Would you like to come forward? Black love and is black wealth. 
And there are probably talk about my hard childhood and never understood all the while I was quite happy. Hello, my name is Kate, and I'm going to be saying a poem, Phenomenal Woman, by Maya Angelou. Pretty woman, what do my secret lies? I'm not people, a built to suit, fashion model side. But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say it's in the reach of my arms, the spin of my hips, the trot of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenal. Phenomenal woman, that's me. In honor of Black History Month, I'll be doing a speech as Martin Luther King Jr. as if he was running for president of the United States. A nation united. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ. Jesus. We are all one, one nation united. On July 20th, 1969, we were a nation united. On September 11th, 2001, we were a nation united. I, Martin Luther King Jr., stand before you today as a candidate running for president of the United States with a dream and a plan to make us once again, a nation united. We can no longer look to the day when a black girl and a white girl can play together. We conquered that mountaintop. We now look to the day when a child wore a hoodie in his neighborhood isn't mistaken for a criminal. The day when we can go to the movies and feel safe. The day when we don't have to talk about teachers carrying in guns to school. And the day when upstanding peace officers and public servants don't have to have someone protecting their back. I look to the day when our great nation go from blood, sweat, and tears of immigrants will not look at their neighbor and see a foreigner, but will stand, stand with them and see a proud American. And I look to the day when I will not be looked at as the black candidate running for president, but the best candidate. And I look to the day that I can stand as president of these United States and know that we are one nation under God with liberties and justice for all. I look to it today when our great nation will look at the red and white stripes, white stars on blue background, and feel what those colors stand for. We will stand together and not care for religion. I look to the day when our great nation will from blood, sweat, and tears of immigrants. We, a nation united, will not look, will, will come together and stand with our eyes on the red and white stripes, white stars on blue background, and feel what those colors stand for. We will stand together and not care for religion, race, gender, nor political party our neighbor is. Instead, we'll for the hardness and value of the red, the purity and innocence of the white, the vengeance, perseverance, and justice of the blue. We will embrace our neighbor and be proud of the word. One nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. We will have that day. That day is coming. I shall see the day that we want to get stand at. One nation united. Una nation uni. Una nation unida. One united nation. In any of the hundreds of languages in our great nation, we are one nation united. Thank you. Seven trees bear us strange fruit. Let on the leaves and blood on the roots. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck. For the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the, for the sun to rot, for the trees to drop. Here is a strange and bitter crop. 
pastoral scene in the Gallic South. The golden eyes and the twisted mouth. Scent of magnolias, sweet and fresh. Then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the sun to rot and the trees to drop. Here is a strange and bitter crop. More than one value of a brown color. And no matter how hard it may be to accept and appreciate their worth, I, unlike you, have decided to keep both coins, shiny and darkened. Today, I choose the brown coin I found lying on the grounds of the suburbs. As though a fate to bear too heavy for change, an embarrassment of such pride staking gatherings is none the more appreciated. With time consumption for calculating in a hundredfold, looking at one shiny as though well kept in safe places. Preserved as rarity by cherished old matrons who sit amongst thirteen stars while liberating bands round heads, keep eyes gazing at skies above, stites united. On one side, the promises to turn newly to the integration of sunny brown coins as reserves temporarily deter dissemination to the deprecating masses of darker similitude. Yet something one could slowly think on. So you see, there is more than one value of a brown coin, and no matter how hard it may be to accept and appreciate their worth, I, like you, have decided to keep both coins, <coughs> shiny and darkened. Today I choose the brown coin I found lying in the ground of the hood, as though no one would ever find value in such minute figures, enough to pick them up and keep them in population. Looking at one darkened and disproportioned, as though irresponsibly cared and worn from circumstance. The wanting of brighter, rounded political faces, of rejecting revisions in capital, engendering scores of self disdain from beliefs that words illegitimately placed over the head of once new Republican, will make sense enough to at least uphold the value of a brown coin and simulate the word tattooed on the back of his neck, and will someday become truths held as self evident. Yes. There is more than one value of a brown coin. But though there are over a billion altogether in circulation, they insist on separately trying to fit the bill, individually rendering themselves as one percent. So I, like you, have decided to keep both coins shiny and dark. I have collectively gathered that since one and one make two, one day, one cent, one cent will help make one cent make good sense. And that's since one and one is two, since further from nonsense, but two cents closer to the 98 more brown faces needed to gather 100 brown political figures together to create one bill. I, unlike you, have decided to keep both coins shiny and dark. Now, since politicians don't even make sense to politicians, mm -hmm. and the number of cents needed for brown coins to appreciate their worth is only accepted when multiplied by higher values and divided amongst political faces too high for brown coins to reach to exact change. Abuse the worth of brown coins in number, like corn plucked in markets from the stock, and have collected enough sense to make sense of the nonsense perpetrated by higher numbers who count on creating bills meant to remove scores of brown coins from current seas. I have tasked myself with a task of the highest difficulty. I want to keep brown coins in population, because I too have sometimes walked by and seeing the two shining brown coins on the ground, the one shiny and the one darkened, an improbable vain thought that even the voices in my head muffled. For an instant, I became prejudiced against my own color when the questions were aroused, do you really want to pick those up? You don't know where they came from or what they could be carrying. Do you really want to be seen gathering the likes of those? Are they really worth it? And it's around that time that I shake my head to rattle change in mind thinking 
I once was one of the two brown cents found lying on the ground of both places, the suburbs and the hood, and have been the both, the shiny and darkened. So I do know how long it takes for two brown coins to accumulate cents enough to appreciate work. But there's more than one value of a brown coin. And until every brown coin realizes that unless we are all counted together as a whole, we will never truly be valued as more than one. So cents, two cents is better than no cents at all. I, unlike you, have decided to keep both coins, the shiny and the dark. Thank you. Could Right hand, and 
the moon was in his left, and the stars were clustered around his head, and the earth was under his feet. And God walked, and where he trod his footsteps, hobbled the valleys out, and bulged the mountains up. Then God stopped, and looked, and saw that the earth was hot and barren. So God stepped over to the edge of the world, and he spat out the seven seas. He batted his eyes, and the lightning flashed. He clapped his hands, and the thunder rolled, and the waters above the earth came down. The cooling waters came down. Then the green grass sprouted, and the little red flowers blossomed. And the pine tree pointed his finger to the sky, and the oak tree spread out its arms, and the lakes cuddled down in the corners of the ground, and the rivers ran to the sea. And God smiled again, and a rainbow appeared, and it curled itself around his shoulder. Then God raised his arm, and he waved his hand over the sea and over the land, and God said, bring forth, bring forth, and quicker, then God could drop his hand. Fishes and fowls and beasts and birds swam the rivers and the seas, roamed the valleys and the woods, and split the air with their wings. God said, That's good. And God walked around. And he looked around at all that he had made. He looked at his sun. <laughs> he looked at his moon. He looked at his little stars. He looked on his world and all of its living things. And God said, I'm lonely still. Then God sat down on the side of a hill where he could think. By a deep, wide river he sat down. And with his head in his hands, God thought and thought till he thought, I'll make me a man. Down by the bed of the river, God scooped the clay. And by the bank of the river, he kneeled him down. And this great God, who lit the sun, fixed it in the sky, who flung the stars to the farthest corners of the night, who rounded the earth in his hands. This great God kneeled down in the dust like a mammy, bending over her baby. Toiling over a, a lump of clay until he had shaped it in his own image. Then God breathed into it the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Amen. Amen. My name is Christopher Luke, and I will be reciting I've Been to the Mountaintop by Martin Luther King, an excerpt. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. And while sitting there autographing books, a demented black woman came up. The only question I heard from her was, are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down writing, and I said, yes. 
The next minute, I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented blow. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon. And that blade had gone through. And the x-rays and the x-rays revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, the main artery. And once that's punctured, you're drowned in your own blood. That's the end of it. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had merely sneezed, I would have died. Well, about four days later, after the operation, after my chest had been opened, and after the blade had been taken out, they allowed me to move around in the wheelchair. They allowed me to read some of the mail that came in. And from all over the states and the world, kind letters came in. I read a few, but one of them I will never forget. I had received one from the president and one from the vice president. I've forgotten what those telegrams said. I received a visit from the governor of New York, but I've forgotten what that letter said. There was another letter that came in from a little girl, a young girl who was a student at White Plains High School. And I looked at that letter, and I'll never forget it. It said simply, Dear Dr. King, I'm a ninth grade student at White Plains High School. While it should not matter, I would like to mention that I am a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering. And I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. And I'm simply writing to you to say that I am so happy that you didn't sneeze. And I want to say tonight, I want to say tonight, that I too am happy that I didn't sneeze. Because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters. I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best in the American dream and taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which are dug deep by the Founding Fathers in the Declaration of the Independence. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1961 when we decided to take a ride for freedom and ended segregation and interstate travel. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1962 when Negroes in Albany, Georgia decided to straighten their backs up. And when men and women straightened their backs up, they're going somewhere. Because a man can't ride your back unless it is been. If I had sneezed, if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1963 when the black people of Birmingham, Alabama aroused the conscience of this nation and brought into the being of civil rights. I'm so happy that I didn't sneeze. And then I got into Memphis. And some begin to say the threats or talk about the threats that were out. What will happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We have some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity, it has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountaintop. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Code, please.
My name is Jada Jones, and I will be reading the judgment day. In that great day, people in that great day, God is going to rain down fire. God is going to sit in the middle of the air to judge the quick and the dead. Early one of these mornings, God is going to call for Gabriel, that tall, bright angel Gabriel. And God is going to say to him, Gabriel, blow your silver trumpet and wake the living nation. And Gabriel is going to ask him, Lord, how loud must I blow it? And God is going to tell him, Gabriel, blow it calm and easy. Then putting one foot on the mountaintop and the other in the middle of the sea, Gabriel is going to stand and blow his horn to wake the living nation. Then God is going to say to him, Gabriel, once more, blow your silver trumpet and wake the nations underground. And Gabriel is going to ask him, Lord, how loud must I blow it? And God is going to tell him, Gabriel, like seven pills of thunder. Then the tall, bright angel Gabriel will put one foot on the battlements of heaven and the other on the steps of hell and blow that silver trumpet till he shakes all hell's foundation. And I feel earth and shuddering, and I see the graves are bursting, and I hear a sound, a blood chilling sound. What sound is that I hear? It's the clicking together of the dry bones, bone to bone, the dry bones. And I see coming out of the bursting graves and marching up from the valley of death, the army of the dead, and the living and the dead, and the twinkling of an eye are caught up in the middle of the air before God's judgment bar. O oh, sinner, where will you stand? In that great day when God is going to rain down fire, O oh, you gambling man, where will you stand? You a murdering man, where will you stand? In that great day when God is going to rain down fire, too late, sinner, too late. Goodbye, sinner, goodbye. In hell, sinner, in hell. Beyond the reach of the love of God. Sinner, oh sinner, where will you stand in that great day when God is going to rain down fire? My name is Cashman Garrett. I'm going to be reading Mark Luther King. I have a dream speech. I'm happy to join with you today in what will go down in the history as a great demonstration for freedoms in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whom symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This moment to degrees came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had secret and flame of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their capital. But years later, the Negro still is not free. But years later, the life of a Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chain of discrimination. But years later, the Negro lives in a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of materials and prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still in language in the corner of American society and find himself exiled in his own land. And so we come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. And since we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check with the architect of our Republican is not free. 100 years later, the life of a Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chain of discrimination. 
100 years later, the Negro is still lives on a lonely island of poverty and a midst of a vast ocean of material and prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still language in a corner of American society and find himself exiled in his own land. And so we have come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. And since we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check, when the architect of our Republicans wrote the magnificent word of the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men, as well as white men, would be granted the unable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's obvious that Americans have devolved on the promissory note and so far as the citizens of color are considered, instead of honoring this scare obligation, Americans have given the Negro people a bad check, a check that which have come back marked insufficient fine. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds and the great value of opportunities of the nation. And so we have come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demands and the riches of freedom and security of justice. We have also come to a hollow spot to remind Americans of fear, urgencies of now. This is no time to engage in a luxury of cooling off or take the trend cooling drugs of gradually. Now it is time to make real the promised democracy. Now it is time to rise from the dark and dissolve valleys, segregation, and the sunlit path of rational justice. Now it is time to lift our nation from the quicksand of rational injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now it is time to make justice a realistic for all God's children. And so we have eaten. So even though we have the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I will still have a dream. It's a dream deeply roots in American dream. I have to dream that one day in this nation will rise and up and live out the truth, meaning of critics. We call these truths to be self-evidence that all men are created equally. I have a dream that one day in the red hill of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave authors will be able to sit down together at a table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state of Switzerland, with the heat of injustice, a Switzerland with the heat of obstacle, will be transformed into an object of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with the vicious racism, with the governor having the lips dripping with the words of interpretation and nuclefication, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exhausted and every hill and every mountain shall be made low. The books legs will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of our Lord shall be revealed and all the flesh shall see it together. This is our This is the faith that I go back to South with. With the faith we shall we shall be able to heal out the mountains of despair of stone of hope. With the faith we will be able to transform the general discomfort of our nation into beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith we will be able to work together to stand for freedom together. 
knowing that one day we will be free. And this will be this day will come. This will be the day when God children will be able to sing with new people. Uh, uh, he is a pastor 
uh, that is um, uh, a man who serves the community. Anybody from Dallas and South Dallas around counties, we were, we were at the cemetery one day, and it was the strangest thing. I never told him this story. And this lady came up to us, Anina. This lady came up to us and said, I remember my family and I were outdoors. And that pastor helped us, took us in and fed us. And here we were out at the cemetery crying, but when she started giving testimony of the work that Cornerstone, he and his lovely wife and the community have done, it turned from, from, from sorrow to laughter and truly be grateful that these people took time out of their busy schedule to come. And so now we have Mr. Whitaker to do the drum roll. Your cup because we only have couples up here. I'd say I have truly enjoyed it. Thank you for the invite. And please invite me again next year. In the first category, placement number three, E5. E5. Number two, let me say that number one and number two, it was only one point difference. Wow. One received 75, the other one received 74. So we are so proud of one, two, and three.
this branch of the library, which graciously supported her efforts. And we just pray you continue to bless and commit our lives into your hands.